Okay, so um, next talk is by Rajesh Jairam, who's going to tell us about new streaming algorithms for high dimensional EMD and MST, and he'll tell us what those are. <laughs> uh, thanks, Madhu. Okay, so I'm going to tell you about uh, earth mover distance in a minimum spanning tree. And uh, yeah, so this is a, a joint work with Xi Chen, uh, Meet Levy, and Eric, who's uh, somewhere around here, maybe. Yeah, there he is. So, uh, and yeah, so I'll start by telling you actually what these things are, and we're going to be considering them in a sublinear regime because this is a sublinear workshop. So, the earth mover distance, well, what is it? If you haven't seen it before, it's just a, a natural measure of similarity between two sets of objects that are living in a metric space. So, we're going to have some metric space X and some distance DX, and I'm going to give you two multi sets A and B, each of which we'll assume for now have endpoints. It's okay in general if they don't have the same number of points, but for this talk, let's just have them have endpoints each. And then what we're gonna to try to do is connect them together, match them together in the lowest cost way. So the earth mover distance between A and B is simply the cost of the minimum matching, the minimum perfect matching between the points in A and the points in B. But crucially where the distances, the cost of matching a point A to a point B is uh, the distance between those points in a metric space. So this is really just a, a minimum cost bipartite matching problem, but we have uh, the distances coming from some underlying metric space. So they satisfy the triangle inequality and whatever nice properties you get from the metric space in particular that you're using. And in this talk, I'm not gonna be so interested in actually computing the optimal matching, the, the best bijection. I'm gonna be interested in uh, outputting some approximation. So my goal is to output some number R and this number R should be an alpha approximation of the true earth mover distance, which is the minimum cost matching. So that's earth mover distance. What is MST? Well, MST is sort of a, a similar thing. Instead of two sets, I just have one set. Uh, let's say this subset A, my metric space. And then the MST is just the geometric MST. So I'm thinking about having an underlying complete graph on my points. And each edge between any two pairs of points is the distance between those points in the metric space. And then I want to compute the cost of the minimum spanning tree of those points. Um, and so this is the MST problem. And again, I'm not interested in outputting the MST, I'm just interested in approximating the cost. So these are the two geometric problems that we're gonna be considering. And we're gonna be working in this uh, geometric streaming model. So this is the natural, when you have geometric points, the streaming model you consider is the geometric streaming model. So this is actually, I think, initially introduced by Piotr in 2004. This is the natural analog from updates to a vector to points insertion and deletion in a, in a data stream. And we're gonna be focused for the rest of the talk on uh, the L1 metric and the D-dimensional Euclidean space or D-dimensional L1 space. And we're gonna discretize this space. Uh, so all the coordinates are a zero one up to some big Delta. Well, why do we discretize? But because we're a streaming algorithm, we need to be able to read these things in some finite number of bits. And we're gonna allow both point insert insertions and deletions in the stream. So I insert a point in A, delete a point in B and so on. And our goal is going to be polylog space, of course, in N, but we're actually going to allow you polynomial in D space. Well, because uh, even to read one of these points, you need D bits of space to specify each of the coordinates. So that's going to be sort of our, our goal. And I'm just going to jump into what is known for these problems so we can, we can understand the, the, the standards. So there's sort of a, a gap in a lot of these geometric problems. This is not just for EMD and MST. Um, where there's a different difference in what we can do in high dimensional, low dimensional regimes and difference in how the approximations work out for given techniques. So in particular for low dimensional space, the result of Indican paper says that you can get a D times a log of the, the grid size uh, approximation in small polylog space. So roughly, you know, if you're in the plane, D is two, this is roughly a log delta approximation. Remember delta is like, if you're in the plane, this is just like looking at a delta by delta grid. And in particular for the plane R2 as well, we, we know how to get a one over epsilon approximation and n to the epsilon space. But in high dimensions, basically the, the, the best known approximation that was known is roughly a log n times log d delta. So d delta is the aspect ratio approximation in polylog space. And this is due to Andoni, Indic, and Krautgammer. And so if you think of uh, uh, d and delta as being polynomially related to n, which it'll probably be helpful to do so for this talk, this is like a log squared n approximation. So what I'm going to tell you about today is a set of techniques and a, and a method to get uh, to basically shave a log to get go from a log squared n approximation to a tilde o of log n approximation. So this tilde here is hiding log log factors, and I'm going to show you how to do it. Well, show you a technique that'll do it in two passes over the data set using a small amount of space, poly log even in d even. So between updates, you you don't even need d bits of space. 
And then there's a method to uh, compress this to one pass using uh, an additional d factor in the space, d delta. Uh, but there's sort of a condition here that this requires uh, some bounded overlap condition. So what does this mean? This means that for earth mover distance, your points A and your points B shouldn't be exactly the same sets. Uh, and the reason that this is coming from is our algorithm is actually going to give you some small additive error. And that additive error is going to be relative so long as the, the, the points, the actual earth mover distance isn't too small. And if the points are not on top of each other, it won't be. Um, so I don't want to, I don't want to get too formal in what that is, but uh, you can, I can tell you afterwards if you're interested. And so for MST, the situation before was almost exactly the same. Um, uh, for low dimensions, we had this D log delta approximation. For higher dimensions, we had this log squared n approximation. It wasn't written down in that paper, but it falls implicitly from the results in that paper of Andonik and Dick and Krautgammer. And we showed that in one pass without any conditions, you just get a log n approximation, tilde of log n approximation. So the, the set of techniques I'm gonna tell you about get sort of both of these simultaneously um, with uh, some different, slight differences that I won't comment on. So here's what I'm actually gonna tell you about in the talk. Um, for the most part, we're actually not going to be talking about streaming algorithms. We're going to be talking about sort of an offline method to uh, estimate these things in a way that can actually be done then estimated in a stream. So this is known as the quadri algorithm, or this is a general method of approaching geometric problems. So I'm going to start by telling you what that is and, and how it's been used in the past, and then I'm going to tell you a new data-dependent version of that. And then in a little bit of time, I'll tell you briefly about how we get a streaming algorithm out of this. So what is Quadtree? Well, this is sort of like a generic way to approach geometric problems. Many of you have seen something like this before. I'm using Quadtree as sort of a, I'm maybe abusing this term, just refer to anything that recursively divides space. But what is the general approach for sketching these things? Well, what I'm gonna do is I have my points in D dimensions. I'm gonna recursively subdivide my D dimensional space. So I'll split it and then I'll recursively split it again and again. And this recursive splitting creates a recursion tree. And so I can think of mapping my points in the space to vertices in this sort of hypothetical recursion tree um, just by following where they go in each piece of the partition. And so if I then have this tree and if I actually were to assign edge weights to the edges in this tree in some smart way, what I actually have is a tree metric and I have an embedding for my points in d-dimensional space to a tree metric. And so now that I'm in a tree metric, I'm just gonna estimate the cost of the earth mover distance or the minimum spanning tree between the points that have been mapped to this tree in the tree metric. So what, what is the goal of this tree mapping? Well, what I would like is if I have two points in the original space, I want their distances to be preserved by this embedding. That's the general thing that you wanna do in any metric embedding, you want distances to be preserved. So the distance between A and B and the original metric should be roughly the distance in the tree metric when I'm now using the shortest path with the edge weights. And of course, why do we? Why are we using these tree embeddings? Why do we? Why are we even doing this? We we still have to solve EMD MST. Well, the reason is that actually, you know, one of the reasons we embed into trees in general is because trees are very nice metric spaces. They have lots of nice properties. In particular, the property we care about here is that these two things, the earth mover distance in a tree metric, or the minimum spanning tree in a tree metric, actually embed isometrically into very nice norms. Uh, the L1 norm for EMD and the L0 or Hamming norm for MST. So what I mean is that you can take a set of points in a tree metric and create a vector such that the norm of that vector in L1 or in the Hamming norm is equal to the EMD or MST cost in the original norm. So this fact, I won't, I'll show you how it's done for EMD, but once you have those things, it's well known, and we've even seen it earlier in this workshop in the summer school, is that uh, the L1 norm can be estimated in a stream to one plus or minus epsilon. This is a classic result of Fyodor Indic. And the L0 norm has been known for quite a while, since the 80s, that you can estimate the Hamming norm uh, due to Flagellet and Martin, and uh, Kane, Nelson, and Woodruff have an optimal algorithm in 2010. So we, we understand these norms very well in streams. So now I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about how this actually works. So we actually take our space and we partition it by proposing a randomly shifted grid in our D dimensions. And we're gonna do this at log D delta scales. Why log D delta? Because at each point we sort of cut the diameter in half and that's the aspect ratio. And so we have this recursion tree T and each vertex of this recursion tree implicitly contains some subset SV of points from the original space, which correspond to that partition. And now I'm gonna tell you how we create the edge weights. Well, what I'm gonna do is that for any edge weight at depth I, that means I've split my, my space recursively I times, I'm gonna give that weight D delta over two to the I. Why? Because at that point I'm splitting up points, which after I levels of cutting space in half, they roughly, they should, the point should be two to the I factor smaller than the diameter. 
So that's, you'll have to believe me, that's roughly what you expect points to dis be distance at if they split at that level. And so if A and B are distance less than D delta over 2 to the I, I want them to still be together at depth I. And so this creates a mapping F, which maps a point A to the leaf V of the tree, where if you follow it all the way down, you just have this single point, and that point is where that point is A. So that's where the point maps do. So this creates some mapping from the hypercube to tree to the tree. And now I'm going to show you, like, you know, how now that I have my points down in this tree, how do how could I use this to approximate the earth mover distance? How do I find the earth mover distance? Well, it turns out that I can just perform this so-called greedy bottom-up matching between the points, and this is going to be the optimal earth mover distance. So, so what is that? Well, let's just give, think about earth mover distance for now. Well, this process looks at the following thing. I have my red points and my blue points, my A points and my B points, and they're all in the root at the beginning. So you know, I'll make a cut, and this splits the points in half. The, the, the points that are on one side go to the zero part. The points that are on the one side go to the one part. And then I'll recursively cut again, and this splits the points up more and more. And I'm going to keep cutting this, uh, these points up until they're all split up completely, and there's only one point in every leaf. Now, this has actually finalized the mapping of my points to the tree. And so what I'm going to do is now I'm going to walk the points up the tree step by step and greedily match them whenever I can. So I walk the points one level up the tree. And whenever I have a red point and a blue point that I can match together, I do that greedily and arbitrarily. But you can see here at the, at the far end, there's two red points and one blue point. So one of these guys is going to have to walk up the tree. So I continue walking them up until everything is matched up. And then I have my matching. And it turns out that this is the best thing to do in a tree metric. And this is how this is, I've described an offline algorithm for you to, to get an approximation of the earth mover distance. So now that I've told you this, how do we actually create a streaming algorithm? Well, this is what is done is you embed it into the L1 metric. And it's so easy that I'll, I'll just tell you how you do it. Um, basically, you notice that this, this greedy matching is optimal. So I just need to create a vector whose norm is equal to the cost of a greedy matching. And that vector is this, is this sort of this, this cost right here, the earth mover distance is the sum over all the edges in the tree. And you look at what I call the discrepancy of that edge. The discrepancy is the difference between the number of points in A that have to go up that edge and the number of points in B that have to go up that edge. And, the, and then you're going to pay the cost of that edge. So why is this the earth mover distance? Well, if I have a discrepancy of some number of points, more A points than B points, exactly those number of points are going to have to walk up that edge to find their, their matching. So this is exactly the cost of the greedy matching on the tree. And you notice this already sort of starts to look like an L1 norm, because I'm, but with weights. So what do I do? Well, I just define a vector z such that the vth coordinate of z for every vertex v is the weight of the edge to the parent of v times the difference between the number of points in a and the number of points in b. And so I can update this vector in a stream by a C A a point, delete a b point, so on. And then, of course, I can just if I just estimate this, this norm, I get a 1 plus or minus epsilon approximation of earth mover distance in the tree. And I can do that using this Cauchy sketch of index. So this is the embedding. So because the, there, there's no little, very small error in estimating the norm, all of my error is going to come from how much did I lose when I went to the tree? So this is what's known about how much you lose when you go to the tree. And I'm phrasing it in a very particular way because we'll see that when we switch the order of the conditions, we're going to get a data-dependent algorithm. So this crucially says that I have a randomized tree embedding that doesn't, such that for any A, B, the, the AB comes after. So for, uh, the, there's a randomized tree embedding for my original space of the tree that doesn't depend on AB, such that for any AB, the cost of earth mover distance or minimum spanning tree is a, roughly a log squared n approximation of the cost in the original space. So we're going to lose a log squared n approximation when using this randomized tree embedding to go from the original space to the tree metric. And this is due to sort of two results of Andoni and Krauthammer, and then Backrest, Dong, Indic, Rosenstein, and Wagner, which sort of got the other part of the min. But like I said, you can think of D as being polynomially related to delta, and this is a log squared n approximation. So this is what was known. So now I'm going to tell you basically on one slide the new idea that, that, that uh, it allows you to get an approved approximation. And what it's going to be is this, inst instead of being a randomized tree embedding that holds for any AB, it's going to be a data-dependent tree embedding. So the mapping of the points to the tree, or rather the edge weights, are going to depend on the points themselves. So the key idea is that instead of using these fixed edge weights, d over 2 to the i for level i, I'm going to first map my points into the tree. I'm going to look at what points went into these different nodes. I'm going to look at those original points. And I'm going to use those points to figure out what the weight of that edge should be. So the edge weights are going to be data dependent. So in particular, for any edge uv, I'm going to look at the, all the points 
that went into you and all the points that went into the parent V. I'm going to sample a random point from the child. I'm going to sample a random point from the parent. And I'm going to look at that distance. And that expected distance is going to be the weight of my edge. So that's how I'm going to define my edge weights. So sometimes I look at the points which actually went there and I see how, how far on average are they actually. And that's presumably get me a better bound for the actual distance. So the picture is like this. I have my points in the child in V. I have the points in my parent U. And I sample one from the child, sample one from the parent, look at the distance. That's my, my, my weight and expectation. And what we'll show is that actually by switching to these data dependent weights, we get an approved approximation. So in particular, up here was the earlier result. What we show is that for any set A and B, there's a randomized tree embedding, F mapping the original space to, the, to, the, to a, a new data dependent tree, T tilde, where the edge weights are data dependent, such that the earth mover distance or minimum spanning tree is a log n approximation of the original space. So for MST, there's just one set, but I've written it for AB here for two sets, but the results hold for both of them. So the, the point is that, you know, the key takeaway here is that by actually allowing your mapping to be data dependent, you can get an improved tree embedding. So, so, so this is the main result. And I'm going to say very briefly, get the high level of, of where this result comes from and the analysis. So a high level proof is like, let's just look at two points and let's see the distortion of those points under this new tree embedding. Let's see how far apart they're going to become when I go from the original distance to this D tilde distance. So it's actually not hard to show, I won't do it, but uh, that this, this thing is never contracting. So the distance in, the, in this new data dependent tree is always gonna be larger than the original distance. So I just wanna upper bound this thing. I wanna show this at most log n factor larger than what it, what it should be. And the, the key fact to know is that, you know, these distances, these weights are geometrically decreasing. So really the only thing I care about is the first level in the tree where they split and the weight of that edge will decide what the distance of these points should be. So if A and B split for the first time at some vertex V, I, all I really need to know is what depth that vertex was. So I'm going to say that ideally, you know, we want, the, we want the average case distance of this edge to be d delta over 2 to the i at depth i. Why is that? Because that's kind of the distance at depth i that we wanted points to be. But I'm just going to tell you without proof that in the worst case, what can happen is that the average distance between two points at depth i can be a log n factor larger than what it should have been. That's what, that's what can happen in the worst case. And this sort of comes from a union bound over n different points, some bad event happening. So it can be the case that even your average distance from your point to the parent point is a log n factor larger than what we should have been. This is some worst case distortion. So what is the worst case bound? Let's suppose my points A and B were distance exactly d delta over two to the i. We really want them to like be together and split at level i, that would be great. Um, but what could happen is they could also split earlier on in the tree. They could, they could be you know, cut by the, by the partition earlier on and that would be bad because they'd be further so if they split de depth J, so in some earlier depth, uh, they split with some probability alpha J. It doesn't really matter what it is, uh, but the point is that it splits with some probability. And when it splits with that probability, it's actually gonna be a distance one over alpha J further. So the distance when you split early on is a one over alpha J uh, factor larger. And then you pay this log N too, because th that's, that was the worst case. So if you sum over all the levels, these alpha J's cancel the probability and the blow up that you get, so an expectation at each level, uh, the expected contribution to the distance is this worst case log n times the original distance. I'm summing over log d delta levels of the tree. So this is where I get my log n log d delta. So what we're gonna actually improve here is this log n term. We're gonna show that in, you're not gonna pay this worst case all the time. So the key idea is that we show that this, that if you look at you know, any path down the tree and you look at the weights, we know in the worst case, any one of these weights these, these edge weights can be a log n factor larger than what it should have been. But I'm gonna tell you that it's not gonna happen at every single time up the tree. It's only gonna happen a, an average of, you know, like say a couple times. So for example, if you look at any path down the tree, what is the worst case? The worst case is a log n blow up. I'm gonna promise you that's only gonna happen once. For, it can also blow up by say one half log n, and I'm gonna promise you that's only gonna happen at most twice and so on. So for every level, so I'm gonna say, the, the probability, the, the fact that it can only up the tree blow up by say a factor of one over two to the T times log N, two to the T times. So the, 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 on, on average, each of these sort of levels contributes uh, log N times the, the, what we wanted. And there's actually only log log N levels because we go from D delta over two to the I to just log N. So this is why we get the log log N times log N. And so if you zone at this point, I'll just give you a very brief picture which shows you what this looks like. This implies an expected blow up of log N. So let's suppose that we have uh, our, our, our point X and we're at some depth J. 
And let's say that actually we had a bad blow up, like our, our distance was a log squared n factor larger than it should have been. So a fact that I'm gonna tell you without proof is that if two points are a distance alpha times d over two to the j, the probability that they actually collide at this level is one over two to the alpha. So if there's 10 times larger than they should have been, they only collide with probably one over two to the 10. So that means that if an average point here uh, was distance log square root n, the probability that they collided was one over square root n. But, but they actually did collide. One of these points collided for this to happen. So that must have meant there must have been many other points which didn't collide. If one point did collide, there should have been square root n points just nearby at the same distance, which didn't collide. Otherwise, I wouldn't have expected to see any. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk a couple levels up the tree, say log log n levels up the tree, to the point where all those points now should be, they should be in my set. I expect them to be there. So now those square root n points are close points. Now what could happen is suppose that I have another bad event and the random point is still a log square root n factor larger than it should have been. Well, if I had square root n close points and a random point was square root n log square root n far, then there needs to be you know, square root n far points as well. But each of these square root n far points collide with probability one over square root n. So there needs to be n points just on the outside. But the thing is that you know, now we're done, like we have all the points. So the point is that you know, every time you have a bad event, there needs to be many points for the, which the bad event didn't happen and you run out of things. So this, that's the sort of the key idea of the entire proof. And I probably only have a minute or two, but um, I just wanna say that there, there is some non-trivial difficulties and maybe you guess this from going from this new data dependent algorithm to a streaming algorithm. Why is that? Well, remember this L1 embedding, what we did is we just had this vector with these fixed edge weights. But the thing is that for me to even know what these edge weights are, I need to read the entire A and B. These edge weights are data dependent. So how do I actually estimate them? Well, th this is quite non-trivial and sort of is a topic of another talk. But th the key idea is we sort of do this in a two level approach, this important sampling technique. So if I look at this earth mover distance, which is the sum of all the discrepancies uh, times this, this the edge weight, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna notice that this is the same by this, you know, sort of looking at important sampling. If I pull out the total discrepancy, and then I look at the ex expectation of sampling a random edge from the tree, where this random edge is sampled probably proportional to the discrepancy along that edge. And then after I sample that random edge, I output the weight of that edge. So this first thing is an L1 norm, I can just estimate it. So really the whole streaming approach, uh, um, you know, finalizes just estimating this, this random variable, which is sample a random edge in the tree, uh, output the cost of that edge. So how do you do this? Well, in two passes, what you could do is on the first pass, you could sample the edge with probability proportional to the size of the discrepancy. We know how to do this with things like L1 samplers. And on the second pass, you actually compute the, the, the weight of that edge. And you know, there's, I can tell you offline, there's roughly how we try to compress this into one pass. There's quite a bit of work that goes into that. But I just wanna end really quickly with some you know, sort of final thoughts. And th the thing about these geometric stream problems is that uh, for a lot of them, there seems to be huge gaps between the upper and lower bounds. Like I told you how to get a log n approximation in poly D, you know, poly log n space and one pass. But the best lower bound we actually know for earth mover distance is that the product of the space of your algorithm and the approximation of your algorithm should be log n. So if I have a log n space algorithm, I could potentially get a one plus epsilon approximation. Well, maybe not, but like, but, but this, these, these, uh, these lower bounds tell us. So we, we extended this, the same sort of statement to the MST problem, but you know, there's this sort of grand open question that for a lot of these geometric problems, can we actually beat this log n approximation and get constant factor approximations for, you know, say geometric MST, EMD, match, matching between points. Um, and uh, you know, can we do it in maybe even multiple passes? And actually recently it's been shown that using two passes, you can get a constant approximation for the Vasily location problem. This is actually a really interesting paper that uses some new space decompositions, um, but still we don't know how to do it in one pass. And we don't have, and I don't know how to do a constant approximation for any number of passes for earth mover distance uh, in like, I don't know, maybe even square root space. So I, I, there's, there's, there's large gaps here and lots of work to be done. So thank you so much for your attention. Questions? So for your one pass algorithm, you have a dependency on D. Um, I'm kind of surprised that there's no like dimensionality reduction to get that down to like, uh, you know, absolute, I mean. Right, so, 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 so the, thing, the thing is that uh, it's actually not just D, it's D times delta. So it's the aspect ratio, right? So your space depends on the aspect ratio. If you reduce the dimensionality, it doesn't actually uh, reduce the aspect ratio. 
so this um this approach of cutting down the space to log times log log was very interesting i'm sort of wondering is there any connection to notions of spreading metrics like the seymour style things because the intuition seems very related to it in terms of you know you can't pay the log at whole possible depths so i mean I'm just yeah, wondering. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not familiar with these trees in particular, but I think there, there is sort of a nice relation to like, you know, these uh, earlier works of like Bartol et al. And how we, we went from getting like there was the original paper got a log squared on approximation and then it sort of went to a log and approximation. I think the intuition there is very similar in terms of uh, in terms of that you can't pay, you know, like at all times you're not going to pay this log in. I will say that like there, there's sort of a key difference, I think, between those embeddings and this embedding. And that's that the partitions in those embeddings are data dependent. Like, uh, I'm not sure about the particular one you're talking about, but like usually in general metric spaces, if you do some sort of ball carving, these partitions, like the partitions themselves depend on the points. The partition in this thing actually doesn't depend on the point set. It's still the same oblivious grid, but I'm gonna make the edge weights in the tree data dependent. So it's sort of a different thing that you're making a data dependent. But I imagine there's some high level connection, yeah. Great, so thanks very much, Rajesh. Thank you. And thanks to... <clears throat>